this chapter, we're going to cover the regulations governing employment law. Employment in many states is what we call employment at will, meaning an employer can dismiss an employee at any time for any reason. Texas is an at-will state, so you can be fired for from your job unless you have a contractual relationship with your employer for any reason. It could be because you wore a blue shirt. It could be something really trivial. Um, you can be fired for any release, reason unless it's a disallowed reason. And a disallowed reason would be a reason that made you part of a protected class. So you cannot be dismissed from your job because of age discrimination, for example, or race, sex, color, creed, those things. It allows both parties to end an unsatisfactory relationship or take advantage of new opportunities. There are also jobs where you're contractually obligated. The employer and the employee are contractually obligated. And those jobs happen usually when they either involve someone with unique abilities, talents, or skills, or they're government contracts, so firemen, policemen, things like that. In those, there's what's usually called collective bargaining agreements, where there might be unionized workers, and a contract negotiated by the employer in the labor union covers all issues related to employment. So in that case, the individual employee doesn't doesn't no, negotiate their own contract. The union would negotiate all the contracts. There are also usually grievance procedures which allow employees the right to appeal any employer's decision they think violates just cause. The WARN Act, which is called the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification, requires that employers with more than 100 full-time employees must give written notice to a union official 60 days before any plant closing or mass layoff. There's an exception, though, if it's because of a natural disaster or something like that. Wrongful discharge is an action that would give an employee legal grounds for a lawsuit if they think that their employer has dismissed them unfairly. That could also be called unjust dismissal. Uh, there are many theories to this. The theories of unjust dismissal that courts have used include promissory estoppel, fraud, implied contract, implied covenant, public policy tort, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. And we're going to talk about each of these in the next slides. First, promissory estoppel. That's when the employee must demonstrate that the employer promised the employee job security despite the apparent at-will nature of the employment relationship. So here, the court goes in and basically creates a contract where no contract existed. So there has to be four elements. The employer has to make a promise. The employer reasonably expects that the employee would rely on such promise. The employee actually does rely on the promise, and as a consequence, does something or refrains from doing something. And then finally, the employee is hurt by the action or inaction in reliance on the promise. There are fraud-related employment cases, and here the employer would induce a potential employee to take a job that the employer knows will last only a limited amount of time without telling the employee about the short duration of that position. So the employer is going to exploit the employee for a limited period of time and then discharge the employee. So even though employment might be at will, if an employer fraudulently induces an employee to take a job for only a short amount of time and then, and then fires them, that could give rise to a fraud-related employment case. Another way that an employee can recover is under implied contract. So this involves an employment relationship that would have been at will had the employer not said, done, written, or printed something that created a workplace environment that implied the existence of a contract. So to prevent this, a lot of employers try to disclaim that. They, they have a written disclaimer. And a legally effective disclaimer must include four statements. First, either the employee policy manual nor any other communication to employees is intended to create a contract between the business and its employees. Two, the employer reserves the right to dismiss an employee at any time with or without reason and with or without notice. And three, no one other than the president of the firm can make any oral or written change in this disclaimer. 
And again, to disclaim an implied contract, all three of those statements must be present. An implied covenant would hold that there's an implied promise in any employment relationship that the employer and the employee will be fair and honest with each other. So if an employee wants to sue an employer for being dishonest, sometimes they will sue under implied covenant. It says neither party will unfairly or dishonestly cheat the other out of anything due to the other party because of the employment relationship. There's also the public policy tort, which is a very broad tort. It's a broad principle. It says the courts will not allow anyone to do anything that injures the public at large. So an employee who can prove that his or her discharge somehow violates public policy may recover damages. The employee would, this is a hard one to recover under. The employee would have to prove clarity, jeopardy, causation, and the lack of an overriding business justification for the discharge. So clarity is going to require the existence of a definite public policy clearly created by the U.S. Constitution, the state constitution, a statute, an administrative regulation, a common law principle, or a general governmental policy. Jeopardy is going to require the public will be endangered if the court does not dissuade the type of firing involved in this case. Causation requires that the discharge be induced by actions that are related to the stated public policy issue and the lack of an overriding business justification means that the employer had no legitimate business reason for the discharge of the employee. Another tort that an employee might recover under is intentional infliction of emotional distress. So this is when the conduct of the employer in the discharge of the employee caused serious mental and emotional suffering. The plaintiff, which would be the employee here, must prove that the employer's conduct was extreme, the employer knew the conduct was extreme and would result in emotional distress, the conduct was the proximate cause of serious mental and emotional suffering. So there has to be both extreme distress and there has to be causation. The after acquired evidence rule is going to be um, applied when an employer uncovers evidence that reveals that the employer could have legitimately discharged the employee even if the employee's claims of wrongful discharge proved to be true. All right, so this has been used by defendants in discrimination lawsuits as well. Um, and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has issued a special rule to be applied when this defense is raised. <clears throat> There's also retaliation and constructive discharge. This will come up a lot of times if you have a whistleblower lawsuit, and a whistleblower is someone who points out something wrong that's happening with the company. So an employee might turn in the company for, for filing fictitious ten, their, their annual reports or they're cheating on their taxes or something, and an employee turns them in. And then the employer can no longer file the, fire the employee because they're protected under a whistleblower statute, but the employer tries to make their job so miserable that they quit. And that's called constructive discharge. It's when the employers engage in conduct that adversely affects the employee's work and working conditions without actually terminating the employment relationship itself. Businesses also need to be cognizant of illegal discrimination in the hiring process, and they need to be cognizant of the questions that they ask their future employees or potential employees to kind of steer clear of these issues. So they need to follow these steps. They need to formulate non-discriminatory job descriptions and job applications. They need to narrow the number of candidates in a non-discriminatory fashion, and they need to ask non-discriminatory questions during the job interview. So they can't just single out all women from, from the interview process, for example. Now we're going to move on to federal employment bodies and regulations that govern employment. So the first is OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And this is an agency responsible to the Department of Labor that establishes and enforces occupational health and safety standards with which employers must comply. A team of OSHA inspectors enforces compliance 
and its many and varied health and safety regulations. Employees are permitted to request an inspection if they believe there has been a violation. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that an OSHA inspector must produce a, a search warrant if the employer refuses to admit an inspector to the job site voluntarily. When a violation of a standard is observed, the inspector issues a citation, which is, of course, a notice commanding the appearance of the employer in a proceeding. The Fair Labor Standards Act provides that workers in interstate commerce, remember interstate commerce is commerce among the states, or in an industry producing goods for sale in interstate commerce, must be paid no less than a specified minimum wage. Employees cannot work for more than 40 hours per week unless they're paid overtime, time and a half for overtime. Of course, there are exempt workers. And then it prohib prohibits the employment of children under the age of 14. Those, that time and a half or over 50, 40 hours time and a half regulation does not imply, does not apply to people employed in an executive, administrative, or professional capacity. Exempt workers are generally identified as those who manage other employees. At least half of their primary duties must be in the performance of office or non-manual work relating to the operations of the company or in the performance of work requiring scientific or specialized study. <clears throat> Identity and employment eligibility is covered by the Immigration Reform Act of 1986, which requires employers to request and examine documentation of identity and employment eligibility of all new hires and rehires, including U.S. citizens, permanent residents, and non-immigrant visa holders. And so this is why when you start a new job, you often have to bring your Social Security card or some other identification type card. Social Security covers FICA, which is Federal Insurance Contributions Act. And here, both the employers and employees are taxed equally to help pay for the worker's loss of income due to retirement. Um, if you are a business owner, you pay both sides of that. You pay double, so you pay the employer and the employee tax. It provides that the employee's contribution is held back by the employer, who then provides a matching contribution. It's, it's the amount that each employee pays is based on the employee's annual wage base. There's also the Federal Unemployment Tax Act, which provides temporary financial assistance to people who are unemployed through no fault of their own and who have earned sufficient credits from prior employment. Each state operates its own unemployment insurance system, and so you will have federal and state unemployment withheld from your paycheck and the way that those things are apportioned depends on the state in which you reside. There's also workers' compensation, which would compensate a worker or their dependents for injuries, disease, or death that occur on the job or as a result of the job. To recover for work-related injuries under workers' compensation, a worker must actually be injured on the job. Pension plan regulations cover pensions, of course, and pensions are vehicles for saving for retirement. So when you contribute money to retirement, it goes into a pension. Those are governed by ERISA, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Employers must place their pension contributions on behalf of the employees into a pension trust independent of the employer. Under the rules of vesting, workers are guaranteed the right to receive pension benefits regardless of whether they're working under the plan at the time of retirement. The law requires immediate vesting for all contributions made by the employee, which means everything you contribute, you can immediately, if you quit, you could immediately withdraw, subject to penalty. <coughs> all pension plans must provide vested benefits after a worker has been on the job for five years. And fully vested benefits mean that the worker is entitled to both the worker's contributions and the contributions of the employer. On, upon retirement. The Family and Medical Leave Act says that employers who have 50 or more employees at the workplace must give those employees up to 12 weeks of leave time in a 12-month period for child, spousal, or parental care or for the employee's own serious medical condition. So that means that employees can't be fired for taking up to 12 weeks off for any of these reasons. What this does not require is payment. So the 
employer doesn't have to continue paying during those 12 weeks. To qualify, the worker must have been employed by the firm for at least one year and worked for 1,250 hours over the 12-month period before the leave is requested. Employees can draw on the 12 weeks consecutively at intervals or as an adjusted work plan, so they could work half-time or something. The Military Caregiver Leave Act says that an employer must give an employee up to 26 weeks of leave time and a 12-month period to care for a family member who has sustained a serious illness or injury that occurred because of military service. In addition, employees are permitted to use as much as 20 weeks to take care of certain non-medical emergencies during the time that a spouse, child, or parent is on active duty in the military. The Equal Employment Act covers equal treatment in employment. So first is the Equal Pay Act of 1963, which requires employers to pay women the same amount that they pay men for the same job. Pro this, this is problematic because sometimes work done by women in the workplace is comparable but not identical to the work done by men. To deal with this, the courts have ruled that as long as the work in question requires the same level of effort, ability, and accountability, and is rendered in a comparable work environment, it's considered substantially equal. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, creed, gender, and national origin. All right, and under this Civil Rights Act of 1964, employees can be discriminated on the basis of race, color, creed, gender, and national origin using two different types of treatment. So discrimination is wrong, and we determine that they have been discriminated based on two different types of scenarios. So first is disparate treatment, which says the employer intentionally discriminates against an individual or a group belonging to a protected class. Okay, so, but businesses do have a defense to this, and it's called bona fide occupational qualification. The discrimination may be justified if the employer can prove that the job, job requirement is a bona fide occupational qualification. Even so, this defense can never be raised to justify racial discrimination. However, it can work for some forms of sex discrimination. For example, a requirement that all applicants for a job modeling women's bathing suits be female would be a bona fide occupational qualification defense that would be successful. There's also disparate impact. So this is going to occur when an employer has a policy that on the surface seems neutral, but has an unequal and unfair impact on the members of one or more of the protected classes. This is called adverse impact. The defense to this is going to be business necessity. So a qualification may be permitted despite its disparate impact on a protected class if the employer can show that the qualification is needed to perform the job. So, for example, if we had a business and one of our requirements was that all employees had to weigh 165 pounds or more. So that doesn't discriminate against any sex generally on the face. But we know that it is more likely that, women will make more than, that men will make, weigh more than that. Okay? So your employees would have a case of disparate impact for sex discrimination based on that regulation unless you could prove that that weight was a business necessity. So if you were doing something in your business that could be unsafe for those who weigh less than that, then it would be a business necessity. Otherwise, it would be disparate impact. All right, workplace harassment also falls under the Civil Rights Act's so first, the quid pro quo sexual harassment is going to occur when a supervisor makes unwelcome sexual advances toward a subordinate or suggests that the subordinate trades sexual favors per, for preferential treatment. All right, this is sex discrimination. There's also hostile work environment, which is sex discrimination. This is going to occur when misconduct, such as sexually explicit comments, photographs, Pictures, text messages, emails, Facebook postings, cartoons, jokes, posters, or gestures pervade the workplace to the extent that conditions become distressing, offensive, or hostile. 
And this is something that you as new professionals or career changing professionals do need to be cognizant of because these things happen in a seemingly innocent manner. You may make a joke or you may forward an email through your workplace that was funny to you but may contain things that would be hostile to those of the opposite gender. And that is creating a hostile work environment, which is sexual harassment. Under the Equal Employment Opportunity Acts, we also have affirmative action. And this is a practice by which an employer actively pursues a policy that will reduce the effects of past discrimination in the workplace. To be valid, the affirmative action plan must end past discrimination that has been demonstrated to exist by empirical evidence, it must not simply eliminate the hiring of members of the majority, and it must have a termination date. So we can't have an indeterminate affirmative action plan. It has to have a termination date. It's Affirmative action is neither mandated nor prohibited by the Civil Rights Act, so you don't have to do it. Generally, these plans come from a court order, but nothing prevents an employer from pursuing an affirmative action plan voluntarily. All right, so some people are, are very against affirmative action plans because they see it as reverse discrimination. Reverse discrimination is a practice that's designed to eliminate discrimination against members of a protective class, but actually has the opposite effect on other members of that class or on the members of another protected class. To try to prevent this, the Supreme Court ruled that affirmative action plans must promote a compelling state interest and must be finely drawn to minimize harm to those workers outside the plan. To preserve an affirmative action plan, the government must show that the plan is necessary to fight past discrimination, that it has a termination date, and that it's the only way to reverse the discriminatory practice. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has a strategic, op strategic enforcement plan and the objectives of this for the years 2020 and 2021 include eliminating barriers and recruitment and hiring, protecting vulnerable workers and underserved communities from discrimination, addressing selected emerging and developing issues, ensuring equal pay protections for all workers, preserving access to the legal system, and preventing systemic harassment. There's also the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, and it's going to prohibit discrimination on the basis of age. It protects any person 40 or older from discrimination in hiring, firing, promotion, or other aspect of employment. So one thing to note here is the Age Discrimination in Employment Act does not apply to young people who say that they were not hired because they were young. It only applies to people 40 and older. The Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act says that an employee who has served in the armed forces and successfully completed his tour of duty is entitled, upon returning to work, to be reinstated in his or her previous position on the job. There is no statute of limitations connected to this, so no matter how long they've been gone, but employees are not permitted to hold back on the filing of a case for an unreasonable length of time. Employees who succeed in a case might receive damages, an injunction to prevent their termination, and sometimes at the discretion of the judge, attorney's fees. The Americans with Disabilities Act is going to, to protect against discrimination based on disability, and disability is any physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities. This could include paralysis, blindness, deafness, cancer, mental retardation, learning disabilities, and AIDS. Employers have to provide reasonable accommodations, and these are things that permit the disabled individual to accomplish the essential functions of the job without imposing an undue hardship on the employer. Factors used to determine whether this would cause, this accommodation might cause an undue hardship on the employer include the type of accommodation needed the expense involved in providing that accommodation, the financial ability of the company to provide the necessary accommodation, and the size and nature of the company involved. Because of the innovative nature of the law and the lack of precedent, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission 
has decided to follow a case-by-case -case evaluation of all claims filed by dis disabled individuals against employers. So a very large company will generally be expected to provide more accommodation than a very small mom-and-pop shop just because they have more financial resources and it would be less of a burden. There's also the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And this is new. This is written to protect employees by making it unlawful for employers and health insurance companies to make decisions based on any genetic information that they have acquired due to any type of genetic testing. There's also, we also have to consider social media now in employment. And so a social media policy would be a set of rules written by an employer telling employees what they can and cannot do when using electronic communication devices, formats, websites, and other electronic mes messaging text techniques such as blogs, text messages, tweets, Skype transmissions, and emails. So this isn't a law, but this is an important thing and a good thing to have in place in, in employment. So if you're a business owner, you would, should consider drafting a social media policy and then sticking to it when you have issues of social media with your employees.